Welcome to my introduction to networking course, also known as ITN. This is the version 7 material preparing learners for the Cisco CCNA 200-301. Cisco curriculum, everything is owned and copyrighted by them. First module is networking today, and it is basically what networking today looks like. And we break that down into things like uh, affecting our lives, components, representation and topologies, types, connections, reliability networks, trends in networking, security, and we're going to end with employment opportunities. So let's go ahead and jump right in. How do networks affect our lives? Well, we know that we have to uh, rely on things like air and water and food and shelter to survive. Well, communication is one of those things that we become reliant on. We need to be able to communicate with other people. So in today's world, through the use of a digital network, we can uh, connect and communicate with people globally like never before. So again, how we use technology to make the world a better place could be a combination, I'm not playing the video, could be a combination of how we use instant messengers, how we use email, how we use uh, forums that actually obtain information and to share information. If you look at social media platforms, we can now share photos and information globally within seconds. Or short videos using YouTube or TikTok or Tumblr or any of the other plethora of social media sites. The nice thing is there are no real boundaries when it comes to communication because we are now a global community. Technology is one aspect of our communication. The human network, that human connection, is still equally important as it allows communication between two individuals and that type of communication is not going away. All right, so let's go and get into network components. So what are the things that make up a network? So we have to have hosts. We have to have something that will host something. And the typical host roles are going to be um, a device that will host a resource. So every computer on a network is called a host or an end device. Again, they have some type of resource that's available on the network. Servers are computers that provide um, additional services and typically have different type of hardware. Servers can be like an email server, a web server, a file server, and so forth. So that will serve a resource. The person requesting the resource are called clients. Clients are the computer that again send the requests to retrieve information such as a website or a web page or an email from an email server and so forth. A host can be both server and client depending on contexts. Typically in this environment this would be called a client server type setup and the servers are typically dedicated machines where the clients are not typically uh, serving a lot of resources like you'd have a centralized server hosting all files or you'd have a centralized server hosting all email not have 20 computers all hosting email so that when an email is received it goes to all 20 of them and they all have to process it so keep in mind in this type of setup client server where the servers are dedicated resources. All right, in contrast, we have what's known as a peer-to-peer -peer network. And that's where every host is both server and client. And we all share local resources. Advantages to peer-to-peer -peer is that it's easier to set up, way less complex, normally uh, no software needed, and it's very simple. Disadvantage not really secure, not really scalable, and there is no centralization for administration. So that means if you want to share things between devices, each device, each host would have to have shared permission set up on each one. So we keep saying hosts are in devices. 
Well, what exactly are the devices in between a network that connects multiple de in devices? So again, the formal definition of in device or host is where a message originates from or where it's received. Data originating with an in device will flow through the network and arrive at a separate in device. Here we have an inner network, which is a, an actual network that basically will act as a network of networks and it will take something from a local network, a LAN, a local area network, and it will allow for communication to a separate LAN regardless of geographical location. So if you think of a, a small community, like a cul-de-sac, each home would be its own LAN, and each of those residents would connect their LAN to their ISP. Here we have Cox or CenturyLink, so each home would connect to their ISP. Their ISP would be the internet uh, network. That would be the one that actually allows for communication between the different households. So this internet network, what is this comprised of? It's normally comprised of what we call the intermedi intermediary networking devices. These are going to be things that interconnect in devices, switches, wireless connections like a wireless access point, routers, firewalls, things like that. They are to help manage the flow of data through the network. Part of that management also entails things like generating and retransmitting data signals or electrical signals when necessary, maintaining information about pathways or how to deliver something from device A and device B, and lastly, notifying other devices if there are errors or issues because a retransmission of data may be required. The most common one that we're going to be looking at are routers and switches and the cabling that connects everything. So when we talk cabling, we talk three main types of physical media. We talk metal wire, typically some type of copper. We talk fiber optic, which is a glass or plastic connection, or we talk wireless. I understand wireless is not a physical uh, medium that you cannot touch, but I get that, but I mean that falls within our mediums. The medium allows for communication between one device and another. So how does everything get laid out? That is the representation and the topology. That's how we define how things are structured. In devices are going to be computer, laptops, printers, phones, things of that nature. Intermediary devices will be again switches, routers, uh, wireless devices. Media will be again wireless, copper, or fiber optic. In devices will have what's called a NIC, Network Interface Card. It is the card that allows for interfacing with the network. A wireless network will have a wireless NIC. It is the interface card that allows for wireless communication. So you need to understand what NICs are, what interfaces are, and physical connections. What type of port is it? Can you plug something into it? Is it a USB port? Is it an Ethernet port? Often the terms port and interface are interchangeable but they're not always the same. So do be careful with that. Most of our course, we're going to be talking about ports being physical, and we're going to be talking about actual configuring the logical interface. So let's move on to how we represent a network. Main two ways, physical or logical. The physical topology will illustrate the physical location and the intermediary devices and the cabling, where the logical will illustrate devices, the ports, the addressing, the more logical structure of the network. Both are equally important and both are typically done. When I do network design, 
I have both included in my network documentation. So what are some common types of networks? The big ones are going to be like a World Wide Web, the Internet. That's going to connect thousands of other networks to work with one another. We have small and medium businesses, SMBs. We have small office, home office. We have medium and large networks. We have a small network. All have unique characteristics, like a uh, large network may have a $2,000 router, where a small home network doesn't have the money to spend that on a $2,000 piece of equipment. So again, each type of network is going to have hardware that's geared more towards their specific environment. Yes, you can have consumer-grade equipment in a large business. I've seen that quite often, though it is typically not the best because consumer-grade equipment is not made to handle the traffic or the demand like a large enterprise device would be. Yes, a home router might be $200. A large business router may be $2,000. There's a reason it's 10 times the expense. Other types of common networks that we have to define are going to be called LANs and WANs. Local area versus wide area. A wide area is composed of multiple lands. The interconnecting of multiple lands is a WAN. Local being a smaller geographical area, wider being a larger area. So when we talk infrastructure, we're talking how large? What's the size of the area covered? Numbers of users, numbers of ports, uh, types of services, and are there any responsibilities? Because we could have a small LAN, but it may consist of a much larger responsibility, and so we may classify it something slightly different. LAN and WAN are just two of the more common types of connections. We also have a PAN, a personal area network. Bluetooth and your mobile phone, your mobile phone and your car, those are all part of a PAN. So again, don't get hung up with LANs and WANs. Those are the, just the more common of them. A LAN will interconnect in devices in a small area. A WAN will interconnect multiple LANs over a larger area. Administrated by a single organization for a LAN, that's pretty typical. A WAN may be managed, managed by multiple individuals. LANs might provide a high-speed connection internally, where a WAN may also provide high speed, but realistically will offer much slower speeds because of how many devices they are connecting. A common WAN is the Internet. Because the Internet is a worldwide collection of interconnected LANs and WANs. Again, WANs are connected using WANs. And WANs could use, again, any type of me a major media. Copper, fiber, or wireless. The Internet is not owned by an individual. It is more of a collaboration so there are organizations that help structure and oversee the internet, but they do not own it. Like EITF, ICANN, IABAB, IEEE, like all of those are major players in helping to find standards that we use. Now again, they're not saying that we have to use them, it's just those are what we typically would use. All right, moving on, we have an intranet, we have an extranet, and we have an intranet. The internet, like the world, the internet that we're all familiar with, that consists of all networks. We have extranets, those are going to be something outside of your organization or outside of your house. They may be suppliers, customers, other collaborators, things of that nature. If we're talking a network inside only your organization, that would be an intranet. 
So again, we can have multiple types of networks just depending on our requirements. So what type of internet connections are out there? Internet connections are again typically the network connection between a house or business and a provider that provides access to the internet. Those providers are typically called service providers or internet service providers. The more common internet providers would provide things like broadband or a digital subscriber line, DSL, or a wireless LAN, or more importantly lately like a 5G mobile wireless service. Those are also options. So internet access can also be having devices access the internet like phones, like printers, like don't ask why you'd have a network printer that's on the internet. I've had a few clients do that, but that's that's really weird. But I mean, you can have in devices that are accessible on the internet for whatever reason. Typically because you have a, a need for that connectivity, so you make it happen. So let's talk internet connections based off of requirements. If you have a home and small office, you're looking at things like cable or DSL. Maybe if you're in a rural area, dial up. Maybe cellular, maybe satellite. However, more realistically, you're looking at cable or DSL. If you're in a rural area, maybe satellite. This kind of depends on your circumstance. If we're talking a business internet, we want some type of dedicated internet connectivity that we know is always going to be available. So we have dedicated lease lines like a T1 or a T3. We have ethernet based LANs, that's Metro Ethernet. You end up paying way more money for these services, but these are typically guaranteed up and uh, there's an SLA, there's an agreement that says if this goes down, the ISP is paying you money for downtime. So Metro Ethernet, Ethernet WAN uh, might be also a better version DSL or better version of broadband. We also have things like fiber to home, which I know fiber is not on this, but fiber to home is, or fiber to business is a growing popular connectivity type. You can also have satellite in rural areas, or you could have satellite in more mobile structures, but kind of just depends on what you need it for. Network convergence is a very important concept. We used to have to have one converged, we used to have to have one network for each type of major data, one for voice, one for broadcast, TV, one for data, for computer, for email, things like that. Where now we have what's called a converged network. We have one underlining technology, typically called Ethernet, and off of that we can have everything connect. And that means they all follow the same rule and agreements. So we can now share our network. This means less cabling, less infrastructure, and less overall costs. We have a video going over Packet Tracer that I will be posting later. You should become familiar with Packet Tracer as all the labs will be done in Packet Tracer. I will show you how to navigate and how to use Packet Tracer in a general flow. You do have one lab which is network representation. Go ahead and complete that. I'll be posting videos of labs later, and if you look in the description, I will be posting a link to those lab videos as well. Moving on is our reliable network. How do we know if a network is reliable? The common characteristics when we are designing a network are things like reliability, and that will encompass scalability, security, quality of service, and fault tolerance. A nice happy balance between all of these four major characteristics. So these are the common characteristics. 
So fault tolerance is typically when there are multiple pathways. So if one connection goes down, things still can work. Reliability means being able to provide redundant connections so that communication can always occur. Here is a perfect example. We have two connections going out to the internet. If this connection goes down, we reroute to a backup and vice versa. This is not possible with certain circuit switch technologies which establish a dedicated circuit because if the circuit goes down, they're dedicated. That is why we typically look for more of a packet switching technology that allows us to quickly change path based off of the packets. A packet is just a small piece of data transversing the network. And we're going to get into those a lot deeper in a later chapter. Scalability means it can grow, it can scale. If we need to add 50 users tomorrow, we can. If we need to add 1,000 users tomorrow, we can. So again, scalability is how easy it can expand and quickly grow without impacting performance or services or existing users. Quality of service is basically as data transmits through the network or transverses the network it uses resources. We have things like a phone that uses a real-time communication. We have a computer that uses a not so much real-time data communication. A website for example. So we can classify what traffic takes priority. If it's real-time traffic, voice or video, it goes first, like a live video stream. That way it is always in sync. Where a website may have to take an extra half a second to load, not that big of a deal. A website would not have that priority or that live data component. Now if you're talking like a Zoom call or a WebEx call, video conference call, that's slightly different. But we'll look at what type of traffic is going over the network. If it's real-time required or real-time uh, preferred, then it gets priority. If not, then we treat it as not priority. Part of the reliability of the network is also about how secure the devices are. There are three goals in network security. Confidentiality, basically meaning only the intended recipient can read the data, read what's being sent. Integrity, that's the assurance of whatever I sent was not modified or reviewed in tr uh, transit. And lastly is availability. And that's the assurance of timely and reliable access to the data for the users that are authorized. Again, timely and reliable access. Within network infrastructure security, we talk about physical security. Can someone walk off with the device? Can someone accidentally plug in to the device? Things of that nature. If we're in a bank lobby, can I see a port? Can I plug into that port? If I can plug into that port and I get network connectivity, that may not be a physically secured port. So let's go ahead and let's look at trends. The role of the network adjusts as we grow. Things like our social media are driving things to use and consume more data. We have this concept called BYOD, bring your own device. If I have a tablet at home that's more powerful than my work computer, wouldn't it be more productive if I could bring my own personal device in and use it to connect to corporate resources so that I can be more productive? Sure, that's what BYOD really is. Online collaboration. No longer am I tied to what's around me. I can now collaborate with teams globally. With everything happening currently, collaboration has taken a huge shift online and we can now work with teams, again, globally, different perspectives and different time zones. Lastly is this concept of cloud computing. No longer do I need resources locally. I can actually put resources in the cloud 
and have my more computational heavy items be cloud-based, for example. In that regard, the cloud-based will be resources, a server on the internet that I can access anywhere. Again, BYOD could be tablets, phones, smartphones, laptops, and so forth. They allow you to bring your personal device into the business. Online collaboration are going to use tools like WebEx or Zoom for you to collaborate with one another, thus being able to more effectively and more efficiently complete work tasks. Video communication, again, things like teleconferencing are going to be huge. Video calls are made to anyone regardless of their location, conference calls, and that means you no longer have to be in the same physical location. I do a lot of meetings with groups globally, and if I had to be there, I'd have to travel constantly. So this video communication platform means I don't have to travel as much, making my life way easier. Again, WebEx is going to be one of the larger products which Cisco owns and pushes. Lastly is this cloud computing. And again, this allows you to store personal items or computational uh, directives in the cloud on the internet. Cloud computing has been a buzzword more recently, even though these services have been around for quite a while. They can also deal with applications that are on the cloud or in the cloud, not so much local on your computer. Office 365 or Google uh, Suites. You no longer have to download Office to use Word or PowerPoint. You can use a web-based or a cloud-based platform to use Word. Cloud computing is made possible by these things called data centers. And they are physical locations that provide heating, cooling, and power to these clients. These clients will put in their equipment and will get internet services to their equipment and uh, allow for these interconnectivities. Smaller companies typically cannot afford their own data centers, so they may lease space. I actually lease space here in Las Vegas at a small data center so I can have my services on the internet. There are four major types of cloud, public, private, hybrid, and custom. A public cloud is available to the general public, typically a pay-per-use model. A private cloud is intended, is intended for specific organizations or entities such as government, education, businesses if they want to pay for it. A hybrid is made up of multiple cloud types, and this is each part remains a distinctive object but are allowed for interconnectivity. So I can have an on site server that connects to my private cloud on the internet, and I can sync data back and forth. That might be a use, that may not be a hybrid, that may be more of a custom cloud. And these are clouds that are built to meet the specific needs of organizations. Trends for our home are using things like IoT, Internet of Things. We can have smart homes that uses sensors, door locks, uh, that allow us to connect remotely and communicate. On my way home, my phone may say, okay home, start cooling down. Or I may be at the store and I need to see what I have available in my refrigerator. These are smart appliances and these are becoming more prevalent in the home. No longer do I need to remember what's in my fridge. I now can query my fridge and have it tell me what is in it. We can provide data over power lines. This is Ethernet over power, which is different from power over Ethernet. Here we have Ethernet going over power lines. These are called EOP adapters. 
Other forms of networking trends are these wireless broadband, cellular broadband. This is providing wireless in other areas. Wireless broadband could also be what's known as WiMAX. The old analog TV actually took over the signaling towers and that became our WiMAX. Moving on, we have our network security. How do we secure all of this? So when we talk network security, we're really talking more security threats. And security threats in this regard are things coming from the internet, coming inside. The problem is we can also have what's called an internal threat. And those are things that are on the inside that are also just as dangerous. Sometimes your workers can be an internal threat. So the threat vector, that's where the threats may be coming from, could be both internal or external. So being able to secure, being able to secure the network from both internal and external threats is extremely important. So what are some examples of internal and external threats? External could be viruses and trojans and adware and ransomware and threat actor attacks and things like DOS or identity theft. Internal threats could be stolen equipment, um, misuse of services, misuse of employee um, access. It could just be just bad workers. I may come into an office and I want to use a printer for my second job or for my kids, whatever. If I steal resources from my company, I'm an internal threat. So what are some solutions? Some basic solutions are preventative controls. Do you have an antivirus? Do you have an anti-malware program? Do you actually run the programs? Are they set to clean up on a regular basis? Not just is it there and installed, but are they active? Are they running? How often are they checked? Things of that nature. On larger networks, we have things like firewalls. We have dedicated equipment that prevent access from coming in. We have access controls, uh, both lists and entries that help prevent things from coming in or prevent access from being granted to things that shouldn't have access. We also have things like an IPS, intrusion prevention system. They look at what should be happening and what is happening and alert based off of those conditions. If we are working remotely, we can extend our connectivity through the internet using a virtual private network or VPN. And so as we dive deeper into our course material, we're going to look at security more in depth. Our last module is more about the IT professional. And that is really outlining the Cisco certifications. This course helps prepare you for the Cisco CCNA, which focuses on more routing and switching, IP foundation security topics, and now it also wants you to look a little bit into wireless virtualization, automation, and network programmability. This is the new generation of Cisco certified network associate. So networking jobs. Are there jobs out there? There are lots of networking jobs out there. It's just a matter of understanding how to look for them. You can go to Netacad to find employment. You can Google networking plus employment, networking plus job, and you can find them. The CCNA does put you above most other individuals. If you complete it and you've done the labs, the CCNA is made to be more applied, assuming you've done the labs. One of the uh, labs is to do research on job opportunities, which is outside the scope of this video. And that is it for this lecture. We have our summary, what we've learned, different types of LANs, different types of internet connections, how communication occurs, 
characteristics of reliability, things like BYOD, things on how to better protect our network, what's an internal and external threat, some of the uh, hardware that a larger network may have, and we talked a little bit about the Cisco CCNA certification. And that is it for this lecture. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out. Thank you.